Man, a lot has happened in the last 14 years, including Bill McClellan, who is with me on uh, Next Up Tonight, and myself getting older. But Dr. Kelvin Adams took over the St. Louis Public School District as its superintendent 14 years ago and announced this week that at the end of this year, uh, he is going to be retiring. So first, let me congratulate you on, I will have to say, a, a job well done and very much appreciated. And uh, why are you calling it, uh, calling it a day at this time? Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and thank you for the um, opportunity to have a conversation with you. Um, a couple of things happened. First of all, the district just completed a bond and received 87% approval. Um, we just tied up three-year contracts with all of our unions, provided an 8% raise to all of our employees, second highest uh, first-year teacher salary in the region. Um, and I just felt at this point in time, in addition to that, uh, the last thing is that the board is in a position that they uh, are stable, uh, with two new board members coming on, as a matter of fact, on Tuesday. And I feel it's time to make the transition and pass the baton to somebody else to do the work. Uh, this is my 14 years, you already indicated, doing this work. It's been a joy of my life. It's been a real pleasure to do. Uh, but it's not a very easy job, as you <laughs> might imagine. Um, and after having some consultation with my two kids and my wife, I felt that this time was the right time. D Doctor, un under your watch, the city schools regained state accreditation, like you say, a bond just passed. And, and while certain schools, particularly magnet schools, have had great achievements, you haven't really been able to move the needle on the neighborhood schools. I mean, the kids are still having difficulty uh, m making grades. Is, is anybody anywhere in the country mm. succeeding in this? I think in small ways, we have done some of that in small ways in some neighborhood schools, but you're correct, holistically, uh, that has not occurred. There are about 20 schools that have been very difficult to move the needle. I, I think we have to not walk away from the fact that there are a lot of challenges that young people face every single day in neighborhoods. We only see kids for about five or six hours a day, uh, five days a week. And so there are a number of challenges that young people bring to the table that make it very difficult to move the academic needle. Um, uh, we have full-time social workers, full-time counselors, full-time nurses in all of our buildings next school year, reading specialists. And so it's not because we've not put the effort in and provided the resources. I think this is a real collective effort that has to take place with everybody in the city. If we're going to move the needle, to your point, in some of those tough schools, and I call them tough schools because they, in most cases they reside in tough neighborhoods, some neighborhoods that people don't even want to drive through, our kids are going there every single day. It has to be a holistic approach. And I think, quite frankly, with the kind of dollars that the city is receiving as a result of the Rams dollars, the additional dollars that we receive from ESSA, this may be a great opportunity to partner in a very unique kind of way to address the issues of housing, to, to address some of the issues of poverty. Because quite frankly, some of our kids don't come to school every single day because they don't have anywhere to live. And so it's kind of hard to move the needle when you see a kid two days out of the week as opposed to five days out of the week. So I think that's, that, that's, the real, I think that's one of the challenges. I won't put it all on, on that issue, but I think that is something that we have to grapple with as a community. Uh, you mentioned a plan, and there is, uh, I guess being in its early stages, a citywide education plan. I know you mentioned it in kind of like your, your remarks to the, to the teachers and staff as you were uh, leaving in a statement. Um, tell us about that, and, and I, does that play a role in like stabilizing neighborhood? You kind of just touched on it then, but I don't know. I think the answer to the question is yes. And so basically, um, we closed seven schools three years ago. In the conversation around closing those seven schools, what we said is that there needs to be a citywide plan because at the end of the day, we're closing schools and charter schools are opening or we might even be opening a school. And so it doesn't make any sense. In one neighborhood, uh, we closed Clay School, the charter school closed the school, and the Catholic schools closed the school in the same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So families didn't have anywhere to go. They were locked out of the educational opportunity in that neighborhood. Without us talking together and having some kind of unique plan, which is called a citywide plan, with everybody at the table thinking about how we do this, uh, it, it just does not make any sense. So we went to the, uh, the, alder, the aldermen and all the women, and 27 to 1, they voted a resolution to uh, not have any new schools opening and not close any schools until a citywide plan was put in place. And so the board is, has uh, contracted with an outside entity, a uh, consultant, to work with, the, with, work with the, the persons in the city, school leaders as well as uh, politicians and others, the next 18 months to come up with a plan. The real challenge here, 
is not the plan. The real challenge is the implementation of the plan, that everybody has to buy in because you don't have enough power to stop people from doing things. The way the law works is anybody could open a school anytime they want to, and the hope and belief is that this plan would incentivize people and hopefully motivate persons not to think about it in isolation, but to think about it as a collective effort around what needs to happen in the city of St. Louis. Well, when, when you talk about the charter schools and the collective effort and everything, when charter schools first began, they made the argument that, hey, this competition is going to raise everybody, you know, that uh, we're just going to do things a little differently, and it'll force the regular schools to improve. Charter schools have been around for quite a while now, and, and they don't seem to be moving the needle either as far as that goes for student achievement. W what's your general thoughts on charter schools in the city of St. Louis? So you're correct, about 15 or 16 years ago, charter schools started in the city of St. Louis, and um, they didn't start out well because of how my, and this is, you know, I'm Monday morning quarterback, and I'm looking at this after the fact. They didn't come, I think, with this notion of a partnership. And as a result of that, there was a level of animosity from the beginning, uh, with the exception of the last three or four years, where we're now at the table thinking about a citywide plan, thinking about working collectively. And what they have realized, I think, quite frankly, is the same thing that we have realized. There has to be outside support. You just can't do this in isolation in a school building, whether you're a charter or a traditional public education, or quite, or quite frankly, in a Catholic school as well, private and, uh, private and parochial schools. And so m my impression is that if a kid is going to a school, that school needs to have the support. And so I'm agnostic as it relates to um, ki what school the kid goes to. What I am concerned about, however, is that the rules need to be the same. And in many cases, there are a set of rules that might govern charter schools and a set of rules that, uh, that govern traditional public schools that make it very difficult uh, to be on equal playing field as it relates to that. But in terms of me working with charter schools and working with those leaders in charter schools, we've done that since I've arrived, at least made every attempt to do that over the last four or five years. We've gotten some synergy around that piece. But quite frankly, no one can do it in isolation. Um, there's a term that... And, uh, Kelly Garrett from Kip and I coined, and that's called cooperation. We cooperate where it makes sense, and we're in competition where it makes some sense. And so that's kind of what the mindset might be. But I do think it's much more around a coordination as a, and, and less around the co uh, competition phase because of the kind of challenges we face in the city of St. Louis. Okay, is it cooperation? The legislature uh, and I guess you know the, the school district, charter schools, they voted some type of, you know, package, and I guess the money has to be donated, but can go to, to charter schools without taking any money from your, your you know, regular public schools. Um, are you down with that compromise, or is that just one like, okay, we'll, we'll, it's kind of a bitter pill to swallow, but it doesn't take anything away from us financially? Well, I think um, I am in favor of dollars not coming away from the district mm -hmm. because I think the district has some unique challenges, a desegregation agreement that went in effect and that we have some obligations that charter schools don't. We have to provide transportation. I was just on the phone just now with our transportation company. We run three tiers of 215 routes every single day. Charter schools, not all, they're not required to provide transportation. They can. It's an option for them. That option for me is a $35 million bill. Um, early child education, we have to provide that. Charter schools don't have to provide it. Cost for me is about $16 million. So at the end of the day, I'm in favor of dollars not walking away from the district. Glad that the state saw fit to fund charter schools to the degree that they thought they needed to. I have no issue at all with that. Not at all, as long as dollars were not coming away from the St. Louis Public School District because of the unique challenges we have and, quite frankly, the legal obligations that we feel we have that they do not have. I'm a witness for uh, Dr. Adams. He was on that phone. I didn't know who he was talking to, but he was on that phone until he actually walked out here on stage <laughs> and, and got wired up for the show. Hey, he's working after hours. He's going to work right up to January 31st. Don't you worry about that. Right. Uh, uh, how, how bad has COVID hit mm. the St. Louis schools? Mm. I mean, you know, there's all, I've heard all the talk about, you know, uh, it's particularly bad for kids who don't have... Uh, good internet mm -hmm. at, at home and you, you were talking about how some of your kids are, are don't have a regular home mm -hmm. and the the out-of-school learning mm -hmm. which maybe for the suburbs worked okay how bad has it been for the city schools so on a good note we were able to provide every kid with an iPad and internet access 
um, K through eight, and every high school kid with a laptop. So for the first time, we were forced, if you will, to provide that kind of technology to kids. On the opposite end, the attendance was really not good. And it was not good for any kid in the city. If you talk to my charter school colleagues, they would say the same exact thing. The virtual instruction did not work well for all kids. There were a set of kids that it really worked well for. But our teachers struggled because they had not been using that type of modality of instruction as well. And so it was a real struggle. Fortunately, we got through it. At least that's the hope and belief, knock on wood of plastic, that we will start school on the 22nd fully in person. Uh, we're still giving kids iPads and laptops so that they could take home and use them. Um, and uh, quite frankly, we're also providing free book bags for every single kid this year as well because we know that the economy is the way it is and we want kids to come not having to say, I need this or I need that. So from K through 8, every kid will get a book bag full of supplies. And so it was a real challenge. And I don't want to walk away from it at all for our staff, uh, for our families, um, for every single person. We have a shortage of bus drivers because of COVID. And, and so it was a real challenge. We also had employees who actually lost their lives uh, as a result of COVID. I'm sure it affected everybody in the city, but it also affected our kids and our employees as well. So it was a tremendous challenge. I am so glad, quite frankly, to start this school year not having to be concerned about quarantining, contact tracing, um, vaccinations. We were the only district that had a mandated vaccination for every single employee and as a result of that we lost about anywhere from 50 to 60 employees and therefore we had to fill those classes when that happened because the safety of kids was a priority for us and we didn't provide any waivers we said you either get vaccinated or not get vaccinated we, we walked away from that on tuesday night uh, the board approved not having to do that because the cdc has changed their guidelines as it relates to that but a real challenge I, are you facing a teacher shortage 134 teachers right now okay. short um about 200 other employees that are non-search uh, uh, vacancies right now. About 50 bus drivers short, although we contract with somebody. We were just on the phone with them, as I said. And there are about 44 drivers short of what we expected to have. And so, yes, there's a shortage. There's no doubt about it. Uh, every night on the, uh, the newscast, they talk about the shortages across the country. I think Houston has 800 shortages. And so it's a real challenge for all of us. I think the, how we get through this, quite frankly, is that we find alternative ways to find persons who have degrees, train them to give them an opportunity to come in and provide some support uh, to our students. But it's a real challenge. And that's how you fill the gaps, kind of? That's how we I, I'd be teaching. I don't know how you, you, if you got to find a, somebody who can drive a bus, has to know and, how to drive a bus. And, and wh whose approval do you need to do something like that, Dr. Adams? Like if you say, okay, we're short, how many teachers are you? 134. Okay. And and we just need to get somebody in those classrooms because these kids who have a permanent substitute teacher's mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. they're just not learning. Whose approval do you have to get to say, okay, we're going to hire Alvin? Uh, the state has been very flexible for that. If I, if I want to hire Al Alvin, I give him, he goes you online. You don't want to hire Alvin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone like Alvin, uh, that person will go online, do um, have 60 hours of uh, college credit, go online, do a certification do, do a, 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 a virtual uh, certification piece in the state will get, allow us the ability to do that. What we do extra is we keep Alvin or someone like Alvin after school to help him do lesson plans. We have people dedicated to support Alvin. Um, pre the school year started with two weeks of training. They'll do after school training as well because it's, it's one thing to say I want to teach. is another thing when 25 kids walk in front of you. I think Mike Tyson said, everybody knows how to fight until somebody punches you in the mouth. And that's the same kind of mindset around the teaching. Well, how many people do you have in that program now? And people who don't have a teaching degree and, and maybe don't have a college degree, but say, I'd like to teach. And you say, we'll help you. Uh, how many people in that situation? 91 is the number right now. We have, I think, 117 building subs, which means that if Alvin doesn't come to work, I already have a sub in that building that can take his class because that person comes every single day. For me with the kids, and that person will bounce into a class because they know the kids, they have already looked at the lesson plan. So we have about 117 of those kind of people in buildings ready, depending on the size of the school. A school like a gateway that has a thousand kids, they might have three of those kind of persons. Another school that might have 200 kids might have one of those kind of persons. And then the other 91 people that we're training who've had training over the summer, as well as training um, right before school starts. They come, we started PD last Friday, or last Monday. They're going through training right now. And they'll get additional support 
um, on after school, Saturday, and we'll pay them extra service to remain, to get the training, to write their lesson plans, to know how to do classroom management. So that's how we've been able to do it. Um, and we are paying them, quite frankly, uh, uh, all of their benefits, uh, a great wage. We're almost paying them what a first year teacher would make because we know we really need them. Um, and so we've kind of changed the pay structure to kind of get that person in that classroom. <laughs> A lot of moving parts, and even with all that going on, I mean, you sound confident, I mean, really even excited about the upcoming school year. So, first day of school is coming, okay? Uh, you know, I know you get out uh, to a lot of schools yes, on that first day. What's going to be your message to the, to the different uh, school builders? Um, my message is, you know, while people are focusing on the leader, uh, meaning myself, um, there are two songs I kind of want to leave them with. John Handy says, hard work, and so it just takes a lot of hard work to get this done. And uh, as the brothers talked about, we have work to do. Re regardless of what happens to me, uh, the work is with the kids. At the end of the day, it's about supporting them. And so I'm one out of 3,500 employees. Um, and so I need them to focus on supporting kids, uh, doing the hard work, not getting distracted from the, the COVID, vaccinations, bus issues, all of the kinds of things that we encounter every day. They have the pr most precious resource coming every single day that they need to impact. When school starts, are all the kids who go to school going to be in air-conditioned buildings? All kids will be in air-conditioned buildings, whether that's central air or uh, units. Um, we had some flooding, as you might imagine, um, with a 42 of our, out of our 64 buildings being impacted. Uh, one dr dramatically impacted, which is so then, and we've been able to get it. We'll have it ready to go when school starts. But all kids will be in air-conditioned buildings, as you might know as well. When it gets 97 degrees right. in those I mean, old how buildings, can, how can yeah, in those old buildings, it's tough. But we do have air in every single one of our buildings, but it's a matter of moving stuff around. Uh, if it gets really, really hot, we sometimes we have to move kids to another room where the air might be working better. But we have old buildings. Our buildings, I think the average age of our building is 97 years old. And so it's a real challenge to keep those old buildings with the air running right. in the, in, in the uh, humidity. But all, we, all of our buildings are air conditioned. We don't have any building that's not air conditioned. The challenge is when the heat goes up, humidity goes up, it's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. okay. right, and so as we enter this school year, and I know we, we like say you put an entire semester, you know, behind you, uh, you know, in early 2022, I won't say things were the same, but y you got to feel for teachers and staff, where's mental attitude at right about now? And maybe, maybe yeah. you know, kids too. Um, I think last year was a real struggle mentally for our teachers. Uh, I think they really struggled with the notion of COVID and, and all of those kinds of things. I get a sense right now that they are pleased to be back, uh, pleased to have some degree of normalcy, pleased not to be worried about a vaccination or contact tracing. Um, that's the sense I have. For kids, it's kind of hard to tell because obviously they're not back yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, but I, every year there's a, a sense of excitement, uh, expectation, newness, uh, the, degree that to, 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 to the degree to which we can continue that excitement is going to be the real challenge. If we don't have any major outbreaks, if we're not so concerned about monkey pox, and those kinds of things. I think we could keep people focused around the work, and that's why I use those two songs, because I really think it's about hard work again, and that's what we're going to have to focus on. And I feel comfortable that our staff will do that, and I think our student population as well. Families seem to be excited. They seem to want to have their kids back. Obviously, with 87% of the voters saying yes, and I know it was only about 40,000 people who voted, but still, that's a, that's a great uh, indication of how people feel about the district in some way, shape, or form. And I think that is driving some momentum, quite frankly, and the citywide plan that you mentioned as well. People see that there might be some way of solving this big problem that you frame around the disparity of what happens in a magnet school and a neighborhood school. Can't happen in isolation with us doing the same kinds of things. Has to be a bigger, grandiose plan that really talks about poverty, talks about housing, talks about all of the kind of isms, if you will, that impact our kids. Can I follow up on, because sure. you reminded me of something from earlier you said. Okay. The Rams money, and obviously that's being negotiated at this time. I mean, do you foresee public schools receiving some of that money, or you're just are you on wait and see? Have you been asked? Um, yeah. I, I've had one or two conversations okay. about what I think, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, it's not so much about the district receiving money. From my perspective, my board members might say something <laughs> different, uh, but I think it's about providing dollars that will support kids in their communities such that they are much more stable 
in their communities, in their housing, um, such that they can come to school ready to learn. That's one of the greatest challenges, I think, that, that, that is before us. I, I, I personally don't um, feel, if, uh, and I better be careful about what I say, but if one dollar doesn't come to us, I'm good with that. If dollars are being used to impact kids in neighborhoods and stabilize them such that when they come to school, they're stable. My board on Tuesday passed a, more, um, uh, a memorandum of understanding with an outside entity that does the following for us. If some trauma happens at night on the weekend, the police now will call us if that kid was impacted by trauma. They saw somebody get beat up or somebody get shot. They're going to call our head of security who will then call our head of social work services such that we can provide a counsel to that kid to give him the support. That's the kind of relationships that we need to create such that kids don't come to school and they're upset and angry about something and we have no idea. That happens on a re regular basis. As superintendent in the last 14 years, we've lost 180 kids to death fires, car wrecks, shootings. Those things do impact our kids. And it's not just the kid who got, uh, who's died, it's his brother or sister, it's his, it's his mother or father, it's his cousin. And in some cases, it's the kid who actually did the shooting that comes to our school as well. So the complexities that I frame are complexities that I'm hoping those dollars can help uh, address in some way, shape, or form to stabilize our families. Okay. Okay. Uh, if, if you could talk to your successor if, if your successor were to say to you what's the problem that i'm not going to expect i mean as an insider is, is there something that you would warn your successor about uh, i've worked really hard when asked this question not to give any kind of comments about it because i don't want to pre um, determine anybody's views about who should be sitting in this seat i guess the only thing i would say on a positive side is that person, he or she, need to make, need, needs to make kids their top priority. It's so easy to get pulled into the political places that sometimes superintendents get pulled into, and you're fighting for things that don't make sense around kids. That could be the board. That could be uh, elected officials. That could be community organizations. If you get pulled into that space, you will walk away from supporting the reason why you're there, and that's kids. So. That, that would be the only recommendation I would give them. Just stay focused on kids. If you stay focused on kids, you can't go wrong. All right. Well, I got to ask you, where'd you go to high school? <laughs> <laughs> and then pick up there and tell us about your educational journey um, and career that led you to St. Louis. And I, I, I know you were down New Orleans way and uh, decided to come back to St. Louis. But start from high school and, and how'd you get here? So I, I went to a school called John McDonald in, uh, in New Orleans. It was, was my high school. Um, thought I was going to college on a basketball scholarship. Got to college and... The scholarship wasn't there and decided that I wanted to stay at that university, which was the University of uh, Northeast Louisiana University in Monroe, which is in the state of Missouri, I mean state of Louisiana. Uh, leaving there, I went on to, to teach uh, in, in New Orleans for 10 years, um, was asked to be a principal, turned it down four or five times and finally decided to be a principal, became the principal of the largest um, middle school in the state of uh, Louisiana at that time for several years, was asked to move the central office by a superintendent who came in, new superintendent, asked me to take over all middle schools, which I did for three years. A new superintendent came in and said, I need to put you back in the high school, which he did. Um, and um, he asked me to come back a year later. I did not, uh, decided to stay at the school. Uh, and then I, quite frankly, left the district to work at a university as an associate dean of the College of Education, Southern University in New Orleans. Someone asked me to partner with them around a charter school. I helped them open the charter school. And then I got a call from someone in St. Louis about a position that opened over middle schools. I came to St. Louis under Craig Williams, who hired me. 30 days later, they fired him. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, like sports, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they walked him out the door. The new superintendent, Dr. Dr. Borsaw, came in and asked me to move to HR, which I did for the next 10 or 11 months. Got a call from the state superintendent in Louisiana, asked me to come back to work with a guy named Paul Vallis in New Orleans to help reinvigorate the city after Katrina, which I did for 18 months. Um, and got another call that the superintendent's position was open in St. Louis um, and asked me to apply. A business person called and asked me that. I wasn't aware of it. I applied and the rest is history. And so I've been here since 2008 as superintendent for the last 14 years. But it's been a back and forth a little bit in St. Louis, left to go back to New Orleans. Um, 
w w what has driven me, quite frankly, is this notion that I really believe that our kids can do well. If given the right circumstances and situations, they can do well. Can all kids do it? Some kids need more resources. The kids in magnet schools sometimes get a greater level of support, and the kids in the neighborhood schools, to your point, don't always get that level of support. So I think it's going to be incumbent on us to try to make sure that that level of support is there and is an even playing field. But that's the trajectory that brought me here. Uh, you mentioned the Isley Brothers. Now, what you going to do now? Just sit around and listen to records? Uh, <laughs> now, I mean, January 3rd, January, December 31st is going to get here pretty quickly. Uh, what are you going to do on January 3rd? So I am going to not do anything for 42 days because I've been in public education for the last 42 years. Oh, all right. Uh, so for 42 years, <laughs> 42 years, I will not do anything. I'll do whatever I feel like doing. Uh, and then I would suspect that I'll be back into the fray of doing something to impact kids mm -hmm. in the city of St. Louis. Don't have any idea what that looks like right now. Not planning for anything, quite frankly. Um, but I do know that the retirement is not the right word. This is just simply me walking away from this role and likely being engaged in another role that's likely going to be centered around kids. May not be in the education space, but maybe in another space. Okay, so you're not retiring. No, you're retiring? no. All right. No, I, I was no, going to make sure I no, asked you that because no, it didn't no. sound like you were no, done all the no, way. No, no. All right. No, no. But you're going to you're going to keep educating kids in some way. I am going to try my best to impact kids in the city of St. Louis because I just believe our kids deserve it. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. And once Thank again, you. congratulations. All nine, right. Nine, nine, Bill McClellan, Alvin tenure. Reed signing Good off. Luck. We will see you next week. Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.